Thanks, Elena. Thanks very much indeed. And thank you to the audience for, for joining into the session. So um, hopefully you can all see my slides at this point. Elena, can you just confirm? Excellent. Very good. So, um, so we are joined, so we're the Digital Guest Vault, you'll hear more about us later, but we're joined by Bloodhound, which is an amazing company, and you'll hear from um, uh, members of Bloodhound in a moment. So I'm going to take you through the presentation title and introduce you to our, to our speakers, and then we can begin. So the, the title is indeed um, Lab to Live Real World Lessons, um, and then kind of subtitles of that are Breaking the Land Speed Record with IoT, or perhaps my favorite one is helping industry to set new world records. So today we're here, here from Mark, uh, Ramona and myself, and uh, we'll introduce ourselves to you in a moment. So, so Mark, um, I can see you're the chief engineer at Bloodhound. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and, and how, you, uh, how you came to be where you are now? Um, yes, Peter, thanks very much. So uh, I've been part of the Bloodhound project probably for the longest time I've ever been in a job. So I've been in it now for 12 years. Um, I started with the original concept of, is it possible to make a car do a thousand miles an hour? And here I am, you know, we're now in 2020. We've been testing in the UK, testing in South Africa. I just, this fantastic roller coaster over the last few years that's got us here and, and hopefully will let you know, know some interesting facts and stuff today. And uh, Ramona, you're, you're of course my colleague at Digital Casbot. Tell us about yourself and, and what you do there. I'm a, hi, hi, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm a senior IoT engineer at Digital Catapult. I landed there one and a half uh, year ago and I joined via Technical University in Romania, then a university in Italy where I did my PhD, a uh, research center in Cork. Uh, and in the last uh, 10 years, I've been working on uh, designing and deploying uh, wireless sensor networks in extreme uh, real world environments. Thank Thanks, you. Ramona. And now I'll introduce myself, which always sounds a bit weird. Uh, so my name's uh, Peter Carney. Uh, my background is electronic engineering. I studied that at Manchester University. And actually during my career, probably never actually used of any electronic, did any electronics. I joined um, what was at the time a relatively small company, uh, which was called Vodafone, and I worked for them, uh, for Vodafone and Vodafone Global in the likes of Egypt, Kenya, Malta, Hungary, Germany. Uh, then returning to the UK, I then moved more into the sort of product uh, product world. Um, I joined the Caspolt about um, five five and a half years ago, and I head up the product innovation team. And it's our team at the Caspolt who try and bring um, some of the things that we build, uh, both uh, hardware, software, and of course facilities to life. And, and my team product manage that. So that's me. So um, the next slide, I'm going to hand over to Mark. Now, um, of course, we are all working remotely in this uh, COVID world. And so I think Mark's going to ask me to say next from time to time. So, but Mark is, is the, the, the hero at this point. So listen closely to him. And if he says next, I will advance the slides and that should all work fine. So Mark, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. So um, yeah, I mean, it does what it says on Tim. So Mark Chapman, Chief Engineer. So basically my responsibility is for everything technical to do with the project. So be that the car, the support systems, um, data analysis, all those, all those types of things. And, and this project has been going, as I said, for quite a while. We used to be Bloodhound SSC in very blue and orange. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So we um, went through a period of restructuring at the end of 2018, and we were bought by this fantastic guy in Warhurst who changed the name slightly, changed the brand slightly, and also changed what our ambition was. So our ambition is to really showcase technology and to really really push how you can do that. And we've gone on this, this journey through where we tested the car to 200 miles an hour. And realistically, we now need to go to South Africa to really show its limits. Next, please. So why do we need to test it? What, what do we need to do? There's this great guy called George Box. And his mantra was that all models are wrong and some are useful. And people get very hung up on the, the ability. It sounds odd talking with a digital catapult here. but people put a lot of trust in computer modeling. But computer modeling is only as good as the validation you can do against that. And we've done many, many years of work. Uh, the car can't go in a wind tunnel, so our design speed is Mach 1.4, so that's over 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, at sort of sea level, that also breaks the airspeed record. So there isn't actually, with only 90 millimeters of, of ground clearance under the car, 
there isn't a wind tunnel in the world we could put this into. So you basically need a rolling road. So the only way we can test our data is to physically run the car and analyze the data that comes over those systems. Next, please. So where can you test it? So in the UK, we went um, to Newquay and we did 200 miles an hour. And we then needed to find somewhere else. So the place that we found was in South Africa. So we were literally on the Namibian Botswana border um, in an area called the Caddy Caddy. We are a thousand kilometers from Johannesburg and a thousand kilometers from Cape Town. Uh, next. And, and we, we sit on this uh, salt lake called the Hackskeen Pan, which is that kind of slightly yellow, yellow patch of desert you can see on the left of your screen. Um, and we had to take everything with us. Um, um, not only the kitchen sink, we had to take the water off the kitchen sink too. So our nearest shop is 260 kilometers away. Um, the nearest accommodation we could find to stay in was 60 kilometers away. So we had this uh, 45 minute commute every day across th this fantastic piece of desert to end up on, the, on this great Salt Lake where we worked. And we had to take everything we needed with us. Next. So, so life for us was, was a tent. We, we literally set up a tent um, on the edge of the, the Salt Lake and, and there we had everything we needed. So we had a workshop uh, where I'm standing is where we've got kind of a little tech center. So we've got a, a server and a, some, some laptops and workstations. To the left of me, we've got a 3D printer. We've then got a, a lathe, a milling machine, welding equipment. And we were entirely self-sufficient because when you're, you're 260 kilometers away from the nearest place, you can get duct tape, gaffer tape, um, cable ties, you, you name it. Everything has to come in with us. Um, next, please. And the working environment it is quite austere. We are in a desert, so the desert we run on is something like 20 miles long, um, sorry, 20 kilometers long and about five kilometers wide. And it is completely flat. It's one of the flattest places on planet Earth. And working out there during what was then late spring in South Africa means the working temperatures in the low 30s to the mid 40s and so here we can see the car getting ready for a run. On the left, the green box is the, is the starter motor. So we use a, a jet engine to start the main car jet engine, but we also have to take some shade. So in the middle of the screen, you can see a table. Under that table, a laptop covered by the shade. Uh, we've got three computer systems on the car. We're running about a thousand data channels. And every time before we do a run, we do a quick run through of all those systems and to check everything's working okay. And then we set the car up and we set it off and, and run it. So for those of you who don't know, the car is designed to be powered by a jet and a rocket. I'll go into that a little bit further. But really, South Africa was all about testing how the car felt when it ran. Next, please. So as well as going quick, one of the key things we need to work out, work out was how do you stop? So um, one of the things we were testing was air brakes. So we had uh, carbon fiber air brake doors. They're actually designed to be opened all the way up to 800 miles an hour. Um, and again, we were running those open just to see about damage. You can see on the right there, we've got impact damage from debris coming off the front wheels. Uh, next. And then the other stopping system, we had with two parachutes. So we had a main parachute and a backup parachute that we could use. And in the top there, you can see um, the rear end of an EJ200. So we are powered by one half of the power plant for a Eurofighter Typhoon. Uh, the hole down the bottom is where the rocket goes. So as we were in South Africa, we had um, nine tons of thrust. So that's about 54,000 horsepower. And that allowed us to go uh, to our peak speed. We did a 623. We did naught to 600 in about 40 seconds. Uh, next, please. So here we have some data. So this was analysis that was done by Swansea University. So all our CFD was done using their, their own code. It's pretty much the only code in the world that was validated to run um, basically on a vehicle in, in supersonic ground effect. So it was validated against the data that came off Thrust SSC when it broke the sound bar in 1997. And here we can see some debris coming off or streamlines coming off the front wheels. And you can see where the rear wheel fairings and where the rear delta is. So we go to the next slide. So we were really key, key for us to see how, how that was to validate that number. And on this picture, you can see right in the middle of the left screen, there's like a slightly pale circle. So that's actually we've cleaned off around one of the pressure sensors. So we're running with 151 pressure sensors gathering data. 
But actually, what's more impressive about this is you don't need the pressure sensors to be able to give you an idea of the flow vis, because actually the dust um, ingrains itself in the surface of the car. So on the right picture, you've got a blister that's around the rear suspension. You can see the bow waves of dust around it that show where the airflow is going. And likewise, on the left, you can see um, the streamlines going out the side of the car, again, from where that flow is impinging. And, and probably one of the biggest things that we hadn't really thought about was it, it's dust. You know, how much, how much damage can dust do? Um, it turns out at about 300 miles an hour, quite a lot. Uh, so that, that lower part of that panel, that's titanium, um, our first couple of runs to 300 plus, that was damaged to such an extent by being impacted by dust. And we're not talking about chunks of rock or debris. We're literally just talking about small particles that actually bent away the titanium. And we then had to replace that with armor plate. Uh, next slide, please. So it, it's very glamorous. You know, it's a beautiful place to work. Uh, it's a horizon that is completely uh, uninterrupted. So here we are. Uh, we're about to download the data off the car after a run. So although we had a, a wireless download system, we also, for belt and braces, plugged in an umbilical. Uh, that's a guy called Joe Holdsworth. Uh, making his own shade with a fireman's jacket, just plugged in to, to download the data. And at this point, we're running the car around about midday to two o'clock, which is probably not the best time to be running. So we're in the low 40s degrees centigrade Celsius. Um, and as we went on the project, we started to run, as we were going faster and faster, we started to run earlier and earlier in the morning. So by the last couple of weeks, we were pushing past 600 miles an hour. Um, our alarms were going off about three o'clock in the morning. So we could actually get out to the desert in the dark um, and start running at first light when it was when it was a mere 19 degrees centigrade. So it, it was quite quite a challenging environment. Um, behind the car, you can see a straight line. Um, that is an absolutely straight line. So we used a, a GPS controlled tractor. And we painted a line across the desert and that allowed Andy to see exactly where he was going and give him a target to, to aim at because pretty much it's a featureless, featureless area. Um, and at the end of the desert, we've got, in effect, was well, a sand dune, and then on the other side of that sand dune is Namibia. Next slide, please. Now, it, it, it's great to say you've got data, and, and every night we were, the guys in Swansea ourselves were, were cranking the handle and, and doing strain gauges, thermocouples, all that sort of stuff. But some things you don't actually need data to work out what's going on. So although our published goal was to achieve 500 miles an hour, actually, internally, we need to do get supersonic flow on the car. So we need to go faster than Mach 0.8, and that would should get some flow over the car that's running faster than the speed of sound. And that would allow us to, to really validate that data. Um, now, because the whole car's not going faster than the speed of sound, you don't get that, that traditional um, sort of bang, bang of that um, going through the sonic boom. However, when we started to go above 600 miles an hour, you started to see things on the car that mean it's pretty obvious that you've had a shock wave. So this is the underbody of the car. This is a titanium panel that was painted white, and it's had the paint taken off it in a straight line. And that straight line runs all the way under the car. And if you go to the next. So where this was happening on the desert, you can also see where the shock wave or where the supersonic flow has actually touched the desert floor as well. And you've got these, if you go next, um, you can see these chevrons that are radiating away from the four wheel tracks in the desert. And, and like I say, when you said featureless, that is that is what the desert look like, looks like. The surprising thing was when we were running sort of 11 o'clock past there, um, after about 11 o'clock in the morning, you'd only see about 200 meters before the heat haze came in. Um, and we had markers every, every half kilometer that we were using. So you'd quite easily get lost on the desert. When we started running early in the morning, all of a sudden you, you can see the whole length. And it's um, quite an incredible thing to see. Uh, next, please. So the other big test we were doing on the car, and this is kind of keying into why it's so relevant with um, the work we're doing, the digital catapult, is that the car is designed to run with a jet and a rocket. Now, the jet and the rocket, in total at max power, will give it 21 tonnes of thrust. That's a three to one thrust to weight ratio. And, and that power and that amount of um, center of gravity position is what drove the fin size. So the fin 
for the car we were running in South Africa last year was actually quite big. And there's an issue with that because if you can imagine throwing a dart, um, darts always go pointy end forwards and, and the tail keeps it going in a nice straight line. And you would kind of think that's exactly what you want for a supersonic car. It, it is, except for the fact if there's a side wind. So if there's a side wind, it will actually take that fin, will steer the car. And, and we've got quite an unusual setup on the vehicle that the car has been designed to be dynamically unstable, but controllable. And, and that's kind of a quite a hard thing to get your head around. But what it means is that if it were to be pushed out of position by a crosswind, so you know, dynamic stability would be if the wind would weathercock it, um, we don't want that to be too strong that Andy can't use the, the wheels, the steering wheel, to actually counter that. So the nearest thing that you will know that is dynamically unstable but controllable is a bicycle. So with a bicycle, if you stop thinking about what you're doing and stop pedaling and, and stop steering with the front wheel, just micro, you put such small um, movements in it without really thinking about it, the bicycle falls over. So this car has been designed with that. Now running with a big fin with a center of gravity, not able to account for having a ton of rocket oxidizer and a initially a, a six ton thrust rocket in the back, um, it means it is more sensitive, but we deliberately ran the car in stronger and stronger crosswinds to really investigate what that looked like. And there's some great video that you can see on, on YouTube and our website about Andy basically power sliding, I suppose is a word for it, at, at pretty you know, 400 miles an hour plus. And that was what we were using to determine the crosswind limit. And, and that's why the assistance from Digital Catapult has been fantastic. Next, please. So this is a huge team operation. So although what you see on that picture is the whole team that went to South Africa to do the land speed record um, sort of trial runs, if you like, um, I've been so fortunate over the last 12 years to work with a, a huge amount of people in academia and industry. And the people that work at Digital Catapult have been phenomenal in supporting us and helping us with all that digital technology. What I would say for the record attempt, which hopefully will be in the next 12 to 18 months, um, that team is still growing. We are really looking to push technology. So all those things that look like new about 12 to 14 years ago, so the iPhone came out the year that this car was originally thought of, you know, we now need to be showcasing um, AI, machine-based learning, um, augmented reality, all, all those things for the future of 5G. This is the vehicle to trial it on, and I would urge you to think about that when you think about future projects and how this could showcase you for the future. Thank you. Over to you, Peter. Thanks. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm very much, much looking forward to the Q&A that will come, no doubt, after this. So um, Digital Catapult, what's our mission? Um, so our mission um, is to accelerate the early adoption of advanced digital technologies in the UK, and for this, of course, helping industry set new world records. Um, what do we do? So we, we are normally we're normally based, of course, in well, we have our main centre in King's Cross, but we have offices all over the UK, and of course, we're totally uh, across the UK now. So I'm currently talking to you from Hereford. Um, we operate and build physical facilities. We have labs and all this sort of thing, 5G test beds. Uh, I guess this is the the, the Kalahari was the ultimate uh, low power network test bed. Uh, we run all sorts of programs, we um, convene and collaborate on all sorts of R&D projects with academia, big business, small companies, and we, we help um, shape industry-ready solutions. And I guess in a way, um, testing all of this LP1 and IoT stuff out in the desert is a great way of, of shaping because you, you really know if it's going to work. Um, so the next uh, slide, a few slides I'm going to entitle An Unexpected Meetings. Um, and I'm going to go back in time a little bit. So um, what, of course, uh, Mark described was what happened just, just before Christmas of um, October, November, December. But going back a little bit further than that, um, there was a meeting which happened at Digital Catapult offices. There you can see uh, King's Cross Hotel. So um, the uh, Bloodhound team um, were there um, with um, the chief engineers and the driver, that's Andy Green there that you see. And they chose the Catapults to make their press announcement to say the following. So after successful 200 mile power testing on a runway in near Cornwall, Newquay, 
um, the team will be targeting 500 miles per hour in the Kalahari. Now, I don't normally attend the digital Casport events because I'm normally working downstairs on the eighth floor. And uh, for this particular one, I thought, well, I've, I've heard of I've heard of Bloodhound, and my my son, who's uh, my son and daughter, have been to a couple of their events at at, you know, at um, shows around the, around the country. Um, so I should go up and have a listen to them. So I sat quiet in the back and listened to these amazing, amazing people talk about this amazing project. And I thought, towards the end, I'll, I'll pluck up enough courage and wait until the press have gone, and I'll go and have a chat to the driver. So I met this chap, uh, Andy Green. He's uh, a, a fight, was a fighter pilot, RAF pilot, and now the driver of what's potentially the world's fastest car. And we spoke about a number of things, um, science, technology, um, STEM, because of course Bloodhound are really big on, on helping uh, youngsters understand what technology can do so that the UK will continue to be one of the, the greatest nations on earth for, uh, for innovation, because the, it all starts with uh, education at the beginning. And we spoke a bit about wind, and, and, and I said to Andy, you know, um, what sort of things worry you when you're driving this car? And he said, well, you know, wind's not, not a great thing for the car. As, as Mark explained, it can make it a little bit unstable. And um, it would be really good to know uh, what the wind's doing, both to know when to run the car, but also, you know, uh, for post analysis, uh, what happened. Um, and and this is an example of the test track. Um, this is, um, I think, a photograph taken the year beforehand, and this you can see the wind whipping up the the dust. And essentially, the car doesn't like crosswinds, and anything more than fifteen miles an hour will stop the car from running. And when you think that the um, the owner of the team is spending, I'm not exactly sure of the figures, but tens of thousands of pounds per day being out there with a team of 40 engineers and the security and the tent and the water and all that sort of thing. Um, if whether the car runs or not on a given day at a given hour is, is expensive and they need to know when to run it, when's the best time to run it. So you know, I thought that would be an interesting challenge to try and solve. So the next slide I've got is called Know Your Capabilities and Limitations. It's always important when you're going from lab to real world to know what you can do and what you can't do. As it turns out, the Casport had, had built this platform, which is called WASP, which stands for the Wide Area Sensor Platform. It was a platform we built um, and successfully prototyped a number of solutions for the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, uh, a company called NSG Group. Um, and, um, and WASP is a platform that lets you rapidly prototype IoT sensor solutions and demonstrate data from them. So I thought to myself when speaking to Andy, well, that's, that's good. I mean, that, that's kind of what he's asking for. So let's kind of offer it in a way. However, the one thing I actually couldn't measure at that moment in time was wind speed and direction. So the one thing that Andy really wants to know about, our platform doesn't do. We can, uh, we can do you know, shock, humidity, pressure, sort of thing, but not wind speed. So, so what am I going to say to the guy? What, what, kind of, what shall I say? Well, of course, the answer was yes, well, we, we can do that. We'll do it for you. We've got an amazing engineering team, and I have absolute faith, and I've worked with them for many years, and I think they can they can work miracles. So I said to him, "Yep, yeah, we'll 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 do wind speed for you." Um, so the next slide is is called um, "It's worth taking a risk." So again, in the in the world of developing stuff and going from prototype, you've got to take some risks along along the way. And I guess this is the risk that I took. So this is our our, our CEO, um, Jeremy Silver. I think he's also been talking at Cogex at various events. So you may have seen him already. And so I thought, having just offered a platform which doesn't support wind speed um, with sensors we haven't yet got um, to, the, to the world's fastest driver, um, I thought I should probably mention to our CEO saying, it's OK what I just offered, isn't it? And of course, his response to me was, yes, it's OK, but bear in mind the position of the Cascorp, because we're partly state funded, uh, we can't just do things for free. Um, so he said, you can you can basically uh, put your time into the project, but you can't buy any sensors. And it's at this point that I that I started slightly panicking um, because um, we essentially needed um, some sensors, about twenty thousand pounds worth of sensors um, for this project. And so I, I was moments were going through my mind of you know, could I could I remortgage my house and pay for the sensors myself and not not embarrass myself to to the to the company and to the team? And I was thinking, well. Maybe, but I'm not going to do that. And then I thought, well, the Catsport's got 150 employees, and if you divide 20,000 by 150, you get 130 quid each. That's not so bad. I could ask my colleagues to chip in 130 pounds each and, and maybe put their put their name on the side of the sensor, not the side of the car, but the side of the sensor. 
But I thought, you know, that's probably not a great, not a great move with my friends and colleagues. So we decided to sort of reach out to some of our partners in industry and see if they'd like to be part of the project. And I'm happy to say that AWS, Amazon Web Services, said, yeah, we'll, we'll do that for you. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fund the, the sensor part. And um, we have a great relationship with AWS and we continue to do so. And a lot of the stuff that we build is, is based on, on their platforms too. So we, we, um, I was relieved to say I wouldn't have to stomp up 20,000 pounds. We got the money together, just about came through. Um, we um, again made another promise to, uh, to a provider of, of sensors to say, I promise the PO will come through. Please, could you ship the sensors anyway? And I'm happy to say so they, they all did and it arrived on time. The next slide is called Feeling the Heat. So the Kalahari, uh, just a little bit about it, it's uh, 900,000 square kilometers. It occupies almost all of Botswana, eastern third of Namadib and the northern most part of the Cape of uh, Cape Province of South Africa. It's an amazing place. Um, daily temperatures reach 45 degrees. The dry season lasts for eight months. It's a desert, of course, so it's dry sometimes. The wet season is one month and it rains half a meter in that period. And that's in fact why the Hatskin pan is so flat, because it is in fact a dried lake bed. So just as the team were leaving, there was uh, the risk of rain and, and they would have to get all of their kit out of there. So. Um, so it can rain pretty hard at certain times. And of course, it's massively windy and dusty. It's, of course, very different to the UK's uh, green and pleasant land, you know, of Hereford or, or Gloucester, where Bloodhound are based. It's a very different sort of place. So testing is going to be interesting and important. That, this is now a typical day of the hack skin pan. If you ever go there, there's this sign at the side of the road. You've got to stop there for a moment and take a photograph. Everyone has a picture of this. Everyone has a picture of this sign. So our challenge, if you like, is to measure wind speed, direction, temperature, humidity, and pressure at one mile increments along the 17 mile track. Um, whereas temperature, humidity, and pressure aren't important for the running of the car from an aerodynamic perspective, they are important from an engine perspective. They're running a jet engine, which is designed to be in an aircraft, and all of those factors affect how it started and how it runs. So we thought, well, if we're gonna do this project, we may as well give them this data as well. So we're able to, to share them that information as well. Um, we wanted to have the option for a solar powered solution. Um, there aren't main sockets in the, in the Kalahari Desert. So we, we did consider the option of running the base station um, off of a solar panel. In the end, we didn't need this, but we built the kit just in case we would need to. The sensors we use are, are battery powered, so they would be fine. We want to have sensors up to 10 miles away from the base camp, from the base station, um, near real time display, so they know when to run the car or not. And finally, we would like to collect the data for post, uh, post analysis. So that was our challenge, if you like. The sensor solution, it's got to be robust. It's got to, to survive a desert environment, um, accurate, good battery life, no moving parts, because the, I remember talking to the engineers there um, in the Kalahari, I got the chance to come go out there. This dust from the desert is so fine, no matter how good your IP68 rating may claim to be, the dust will get through. And I, I have to say, I, I took a, a video camera with me and it, it never went outside of its case. And yet um, the, du the dust came, it came back with, with uh, dust that I got through gaskets, O-rings, silicone sealant, amazing. And, and we decided to be moisture resistant too. So for that, we chose this particular sensor. It's a company called Decent Lab, who are based in Switzerland, put it together. They uh, it's called the AMOS 22. It measures all the things we want and more, direction, speed, gust, temperature, battery life. Uh, they were a fantastic supplier. It turned up exactly as promised. They took risk with us, I have to say. They uh, shipped it without, without the payment being made, but I have to say we followed up and, and it's all been paid for. And it turned up precisely on the day. We powered them up and they just came online. And it's so nice in the world of prototyping and IoT to have devices that do that. Off Often, more often than not, we play with devices where you have to open it up, reset it, regrade, upgrade the firmware, and this just worked out of the, out of the tin, so it was out of the box, so it was, it was really good. In terms of the solar panel, um, we built this, this rig. It was a battery a battery from Halford, solar panel from a, from a company who, who do um, solutions for um, caravans. Um, and when I was testing this on the balcony, and it was cold in the UK at that point, I had it on our balcony in, in London, and I put my hand on it and this thing was too hot to, to touch. And I was thinking, my God, you know, if it's, uh, if it's not, if it's over, if it's getting hot here, is it going to work in the Kalahari? Now I thought back to my times in Egypt and thought, well, they do have solar panels out in hot places. So 
it'll probably be okay. So maybe another risk we took. It, we didn't use it in the end, but it is actually all fine. We do have these out in the desert now. And they're, they're good. Uh, this is a bit of field testing. So this is the field uh, uh, next to a place called Credden Hill, which is in Hereford. So I thought before shipping these to the Bloodhound team, I'd test them. So you can see the sort of 20, uh, 15 or so sensors set up. Uh, these are, uh, are on uh, wooden poles, which are in fact broom handles from Screwfix. So another bit of, of using the assets that you've got easily available. And, uh, and that's all perfect. They worked perfectly and they talked to the base, base stations beautifully and, and they, they worked out amazingly. And I have to say our, our kids aged uh, eight and 11 helped to get all this rigged up and took some of the drone photography. I then delivered it to the Bloodhound team. Um, this is Josh again. Uh, Mark mentioned that he's responsible for um, telemetry on the car and sensor systems. So we put them in a, a nice flight case um, and took them down there to Gloucester to their bases, base there. A half of their training produced a, a super manual and, uh, and uh, handed it over. Why have I got a picture of their titanium steering wheel? Because it was such a nice thing to say. The steering wheel of the car is printed, is 3D printed with titanium. And I think I, I said, why is that? And they said, because we could. So again, pushing technology to its limits and maybe doing things that you wouldn't have otherwise done in a normal, normal world. This is the kit that I took um, out there. So I've been watching the team um, battle wind, um, wind storms and, and, and um, it's of course a working working lab. So we need to have, have foot protection. I took a camera to, took some photographs. It was gonna be noisy because we're next to a jet engine. I thought I'd take some urofen and Imodium just in case, never used them in the end. The food, hospitality and everything was fantastic. And I don't know oil and some money is always useful too. Uh, this is uh, me out there. Um, this is the um, one of the sensors. It's it's mounted onto a scaffolding pole, which was uh, then welded onto a um, hub of a, of a car, vehicle, truck. Uh, this image here is the base station, which is on their um, control and command center. And that's a picture on the right is, is a lady called Jess. And she was, if you like, the uh, car controller. So she'd tell the car when to run, when not to run and, and would clear clear the run, runway of people and all that sort of thing. Huge thank you to Ricardo. He was the guy who looked after me. Uh, he was one of the marshals that was there and uh, made sure I didn't stray onto the track. And we spent many hours stood at the side of the track waiting for the car to run, talking about the ins and outs of all sorts of things. And I want to say a big thank you to him. We had fantastic on-site support. So um, AWS flew someone out there just in case anything went wrong with the cloud, which was, I think, based in London. Uh, nothing went down. It would all work perfectly. But it was nice to have them on, on site as well because they're a big part of the project. And we, we got to meet and talk to everyone. Uh, very quickly, this is a dashboard. This is, in fact, showing um, temperature, humidity, and uh, I think uh, temperature and humidity and, and pressure data. And we could switch it into wind speed and direction. So that was the Bloodhound dashboard that we had developed. Um, my last slide before I hand over to Ramona, we got a very nice email from Andy uh, saying the sensor network is proving invaluable and is being used daily as part of operating the car safely. Thank you. As with all other things, Bloodhound, it's helping us to do things in a better way than anything before us. So it is much appreciated, especially by me. While I'm fighting the crosswinds at 400 plus miles per hour, knowing about them in advance makes all the difference. So that was a fantastic email to receive and I really appreciate that. So I'm now gonna hand over to Ramona who is gonna talk about her uh, presentation called, does it do what it says on the tin? Do the lab claims really match the world reality, the real world reality? So Ramona, I'd like to hand over to you, please. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. It's uh, shared with uh, everybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do a bit of a detour from the fascinating and uh, challenging uh, environment where uh, the IoT solution was uh, deployed. And I'm gonna take you with me on um, to other um, sites and uh, environments where in the last years, the groups I've worked with uh, deployed uh, sensor networks like uh, tunnels where we deployed uh, networks for uh, controlling the lights or uh, very dense forests, uh, deploying uh, monitoring, uh, 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 solutions of temperature and uh, humidity. Uh, also in the Alps, uh, where we were monitoring uh, the social uh, life of, uh, of deer and uh, of uh, up to the um, 
uh, industrial uh, environments uh, during the Connected Factory uh, project uh, we were running at the, at the Digital Catapult. Uh, what all this experience uh, showed us and showed uh, uh, to me and taught us is actually how much more difficult is to run and to manage a wireless sensor networks, call it IoT uh, if you want, in a real world environment than in a controlled uh, environment uh, um, as it is uh, the lab. And uh, actually all these deployments that I've seen uh, uh, working uh, in the real uh, world demonstrated once more, if needed, that there is a tremendous gap between a network and a solution and a device working in the lab and the same thing working uh, in the real world. And uh, this is uh, partially due to the fact that most of the times the lab where we test our solutions looks like that, while uh, the real world where we deploy the solution is a bit uh, different. And uh, when we immerse our devices, our protocols and our applications in these uh, environments, their behavior is affected. The behavior of the device is affected, the, therefore the behavior of the links is affected. It has an impact on the protocols and at the end of the day, this has an impact on the applications. The temperature, the foliage, presence of uh, obstacles, interference, they all have an impact on all the layers of our, uh, of our network stack. And we have another problem. When we are running our tests in the lab, most of the times we are lacking traces from our target uh, environments where our networks are supposed to work. And sometimes we do not have access to our target environments to collect those traces. Think about the Bloodhound project. You would have to go in desert, collect traces in order to understand what is happening to your network, come back to London and uh, uh, redesign maybe or adjust your uh, application. Sometimes that is not, uh, most of the times actually is not uh, possible. And then if you don't have this quantitative evidence of how the environment actually uh, affects your devices, affects your links, and at the end of the day, uh, your application, what most of us end up doing is uh, running simulations or using test beds that most of the time they are far away from the real world uh, uh, environment. So therefore, we are still at the point where uh, the IoT community has a, gra uh, a grand uh, challenge, and that is of uh, designing and deploying dependable uh, IoT uh, solutions. Just think about the uh, application space and all the environments in, uh, in which uh, we as a community, we have to uh, deploy, uh, we have to deploy uh, applications. There is no magic solution for us that uh, fits, uh, fits, uh, fits them all, fits all the environments and all the requirements. Think about the Bloodhound project. There is a plethora of uh, hardware platforms, approaches and technologies to choose from. Which one would you have picked to, uh, to solve the problem? Maybe in order to, mask the to take the best decision around the hardware platform and the technology specific for the use case, uh, you would have run um, or you would have benefited from uh, quantitatively uh, comparing performance of different devices and different technologies that are available uh, uh, on the market and have this in mind uh, when you uh, design uh, your final uh, solution. But there is another problem <laughs> that you have to think about because your solution has to be uh, dependable. So uh, the device uh, running on uh, batteries have, has actually to live in the environment where it's deployed as long as possible. Uh, and there should be no uh, human intervention or at least not that often to change, uh, to change the batteries of, uh, of these devices. Uh, how, how, how would you go around this? So how would you, how would you uh, when Bloodhound comes to you and asks you, okay, you're gonna deploy this network for me. Maybe I have to run the test for three months. Are the devices gonna actually uh, survive and live for uh, three months uh, in the desert? You would need to run some power consumption measurements of the device and uh, also of the application that is running on, uh, on, top of, uh, on top of the devices. And you would have to predict this uh, uh, battery lifetime. Of course, you can tell me, Ramona, but this is a simple problem. Just take the data sheet of the device, run some uh, computations, and you are going to get the battery lifetime. But is it really what we sh should do? 
when we uh, have to derive the uh, battery lifetime of our uh, devices that are And uh, we also looked uh, at the battery lifetime, computing it, and also uh, deploying and immersing uh, these uh, devices in different uh, urban environments and looking at their communication performance and uh, characterize the uh, devices. And uh, guess what the experiments uh, showed us at the end of the day? That the battery lifetime from the data sheet, and I'm talking about 10 devices now, 10 different devices never actually match the battery lifetime that was computed, taking into consideration uh, the measurements and all the possible conditions and communication uh, parameters. And if you want to know more about this, come into the Q&A session and ask us. Thank you. Thanks, Ramona. Right, so I think um, I wanted to, um, I think we're going to have uh, a sort of final uh, Q&A session as, as mentioned uh, by Ramona, but I wanted to say a huge thank you to, to Mark, Ramona um, and the COGEX team for bringing this, uh, this thing to life. It's an absolutely fabulous project and we totally look forward to working with you um, in the future and working on this sort of thing. Um, I'm happy to say all the sensors came back safely. I've, I've washed the dust out of them and it's all ready to go and the, the solar panels have cooled down. So amazing. And Ramona, thank you very much indeed. It looks like you've been to some amazing places too. And I'm sure our uh, people who are going to dial into the panel will be very interested to hear more about those sorts of things too. So thank you for joining me today. I hope it's been interesting to our audience. And uh, we'll speak again soon. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.